145. If you don't have a Bible with you, we encourage you to use one of the ones that are there in the pew. Please take that out and turn with us, if you would, to Psalm 145. And that's on page 563 in the pew Bible. Page 163 in the pew Bible, Psalm 145. Um, I am glad to see Brother Nichols here this morning, and uh, we had a, a very beautiful memorial service for Miss Wilma on Thursday, and uh, the service uh, showed honor to her and her life and the great woman that she was and is, and it also honored the Lord. The gospel was given, we thank the Lord for that, and um, of course, uh, we'll be praying for Brother Jim and, and the family in the days and weeks to come, uh, the preacher uh, who did the, the uh, service, uh, he was uh, Brother Jim and Miss Wilma's pastor when they would go to Florida in the winter. And uh, Brother Phil Wade is his name. And he did a fantastic job uh, on the message. And uh, one of the things he said that, that was really encouraging, I thought, was he said, you know, a lot of times when, when someone passes away, we say we've lost a loved one. And he said, but in Miss Wilma's case, we've not lost her. We know exactly where she is. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. And we know she's with the Lord, and it's just a matter of time until we'll all be uh, together with her and with him forever and ever. And so, Brother Jim, we love you, and we'll be praying for you and your family. And uh, we're glad you're here this morning. Well, on Sunday mornings, we've been going through a series. We started one last week entitled, What Keeps You Up at Night? What Keeps You Up at Night? Boy, oh boy, we could think of a lot of kind of humorous things and even some serious things that, that may keep us up at night. But as we go through this series, we want to address some things in our lives that often can paralyze us in our spiritual life and even in our, in our physical walk. Things like worry and anxiety and stress. Just saying those words make the room feel a little heavier don't they? They, they kind of weigh you down a little bit when you think of worry and anxiety and stress. And even though we may not call them that and we may Christianize it and say, well, I don't worry, I just I'm just concerned, you know, or whatever. Um, it, it's a fact of life that all of us are going to have things that weigh on our minds and will cause us to wonder. Will cause us to wonder. And that's really uh, what this is all summed up by. And so this morning, we're going to look at the subject of worry, worrying. Now, I won't ask us to raise our hands, but many of us, we would consider ourselves to be a worry wart. We, we're just, by nature, we worry about things. We worry about the people that we love. We worry about ourselves. We worry about the things that we love. And so it's constantly on our minds and on our thoughts, and it really bogs us down and weighs us down. And so when we think of worry, of course, you know, like every good preacher when he starts, if you have a word like that, you've got to look it up, right? So he looked up the word worry, and it's to torment oneself with alarming thoughts. To torment oneself with alarming thoughts. And the alarms are going off right now, aren't they? We can, boy, and I know how we are. We come into the house of the Lord, and some Sundays we bring a load of worry in here with us. We bring a load of care. And, and we have things in our life that are weighing us down and, and they're, they're hurting our mind and our spirit. And, and as you understand how worry works, it works itself out and actually affects those that are around us as well. So what does the Bible say about worry? Now we've all probably from time to time heard a sermon on don't worry. You know, God's got it under control. Everything's fine. And of course, we all think of the wonderful song, Don't Worry, Be Happy, and uh, all of the, really, nobody, that's, don't worry, be happy? All right, thank you. Well, I tried. Um, don't worry, be happy. What's that guy's name, Bobby? McFerrin, Bobby McFerrin, yeah. Don't the worry, be happy now. You know, that guy. <laughs> it's okay to laugh, all right? Or was like, he's singing a secular song in the, no, it's, it's. It's a happy song, you know, don't worry, be happy, and uh, help us. All right, we don't want to worry, right? And what does the Bible say about worry? Well, those, those thoughts that torment us, maybe this sounds familiar. 
Will I have what I need? Will we have what we need? How about, will this be the end? How about this question? Will I be enough for the other people in my life? Those are some high-level things that we worry about. Will we have what we need? Will this be the end? And will I be enough? And those are things that weigh us down. Alarming thoughts take no thought of certainty. When we're worried, every fact that we know typically kind of goes off to the side. I don't know about you, but I can become really unrational when I worry. You know, you're waiting to hear from the doctor. You're waiting to see the bank account. You're wanting to hear that phone call back from the person that you've called or the text back from the person. And you're wondering the whole time, what's going to come back from this? And of course, a lot of us by nature will tend to think of the worst case scenario. And they take no thoughts of certainty. They take no thoughts of things that are for sure. We typically think of what could happen instead of what we know for sure. You know, we have to change the way we think when worry rises up within us. When worry comes into our lives, we have to uh, take the opportunity to uh, specifically change the way we think. We have to make an effort to think differently. Um, It's not just going to happen. It's not just going to sweep through the room and all of a sudden everything's going to be okay. We can control it. We can take thought of things and certainties and facts that will help that worry to go to the side and bring the certain things and the facts to the forefront. Don't focus on the uncertainties. Focus on the things that are certain. While people and circumstances are uncertain, and they are, right? I mean, sometimes I don't even know what I'm going to do, you know, let alone what everybody else around me is going to do. People and circumstances are uncertain. But there are two things that we're going to see in this psalm this morning that are certain. We're going to see two things that are concrete. Two things that are facts that will not change. Two things that have been facts from before time as we know it and will be facts forever and ever and ever. And we're going to see it right here in this psalm of David this morning. Two things are this. Number one, God is great. God is great. Number two, God is good. God is good. Those two things are indisputable. Those two things are certain facts you can take to the bank, that you can hang your hat on, that you can build your house on. They're not going anywhere. God is great, and God is good. Let's look at the psalm here this morning. Now, I want you to notice, verses 1 through 7, it's going to talk about how God is great. And then verses 8 through 21 are going to talk about how God is good. And you'll see those words, great and good, in those sections. God is great, And God is good. Psalm 145, beginning in verse 1. I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the the memory of the great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness." 
The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all His works. All Thy works shall praise Thee, O Lord, and Thy saints shall bless Thee. They shall speak of the glory of Thy kingdom and talk of Thy power. To make known the sons of men His mighty acts and the glorious majesty of His kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and Thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. The Lord upholdeth all that fall, and raiseth up all those that be bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon Thee, and Thou givest them their meat in due season. Thou openest Thy hand, and satisfiest the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry, and will save them. The Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless His holy name forever and ever. Let's pray. Our Father, we are thankful this morning for Your Word, and that we can open it, and we can hear directly from You. And Lord, I, I'm thankful that You've preserved it, so that we can read Your very words and know exactly what You say, and who You are, and what You do. And so this morning, Father, as I I ask for all of us in here who maybe now are sitting under a load of worry or from time to time carry around worry, Lord, that you would stamp upon our minds these certainties about you. God, that we would leave here today equipped um, in our minds to be prepared for when worry does rise up, that we will be reminded and, in fact, proclaim these two certainties, that you are great and you are good. God, work in the hearts of everyone here today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So God is great. You know, when we worry, we are alarmed by things and people and circumstances around us, and we wonder what's going to happen. What's going to happen? And so it's easy for us to sit under that load of worry and to take our thoughts down all kinds of of very bad roads. But we need to keep the certainties of God in our forefront and in the front of our minds. Again, this is about our thinking. This is about how we view times of uncertainty. Think of the certain things in life. And the first thing, as we saw in verses 1 through 7, is God is great. Now let's break down this psalm, and I, and I hope you, you, maybe even while we were reading just a minute ago, maybe you latched on to one of those phrases, or, or one of those verses, and you thought, man, that's me right now, or God spoke to your life and your heart in that moment, and it really took hold of you. And I hope as we go through this this morning, you'll be encouraged. And if you do have a load of worry and care this morning, I, it's our prayer that is, the Word of God ministers to our souls that that worry will just go fade away. First of all, David says this, I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Wow, a couple of neat things there we see uh, come out of the pen of David here. First of all, he's going to praise God. He's going to exalt. Extol is like exalting praising God, his king. He's going to bless his name forever and ever. He has it in his mind and his heart to never stop praising God. He says, every day will I bless thee. I will praise thy name forever and ever. Why would David praise God? Well, why would we praise God? Do we praise God? But David says here in the very beginning, he starts out this psalm with, I am going to praise you every day, forever and ever. Why? Verse 2, or verse 3. Look what he says. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. God is great, meaning 
so large and wise and intelligent and powerful that it is high and far above anything that man can comprehend. God, all of him, is great. Great beyond our understanding. He's great big. He's great powerful. He's great good. And you see that here in this verse. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. His greatness is so large, we can't even figure it out. It's unsearchable. You can't see it all. Like the heavens, the Hubble, and all the other telescopes they have. Can't see all of the heavens. All of the technology that we have in this world. Can't see all of the seas. And those are just things that God spoke into existence. And if the things that he spoke into existence, we can't search them, how in the world can we search the greatness of that God? We can't. So when worry seeps in, <clears throat> remember, your God, your Father, is way bigger than anything I can worry about today. Verse 4. One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. I could sit here for a long time this morning on verse 4, but I'll say this. His greatness spans the generations. That's why it's important for our folks who have years of experience of being a Christian to praise the Lord uh, to the next generation, to talk about God's works in your life, to talk about how God has sustained you and how God has blessed you and how you've seen God work in your life. And as we uh, turn over generations, that same praise, that same theme should be going on and on and on till the end of the age. One generation shall praise him to another. Young people, if you consider yourself, when I said young people, it's interesting, some people looked up. That was cool. And it wasn't like people that you would call maybe young. That was neat. But anyway, young people, if you're young in your mind, praise the Lord. Young people, you should praise the Lord to the older generation. Hey, it's not all about coming to church and letting all the seasoned Christians do it all. Why don't you be an example? Paul told Timothy, be an example to the believers. Show them. One generation, so praise the Lord to the other. Praise back and forth. And I'm going to hit this because it's really on my heart. That's why we sing at church. To praise the Lord to each other. Look at the verses in the New Testament about singing. What does it say? Singing in your hearts. Teaching one to another. You know what would be weird but would be biblical is to turn around and sing to the person behind you. Now if everybody turned around that wouldn't work. But if, if we all just stood across from somebody and sang and that person sang back to us, that's kind of what the Bible's getting at here. We're supposed to feed each other. That's why we sing as a congregation. That's why we sing out to each other. Did you realize this morning you taught if you sang? That's pretty cool, isn't it? If you sang the songs this morning, you were teaching the people around you. You were proclaiming, you were praising God one generation to another. That's neat. That's what it's all about. But his greatness spans the generations. Verse 5. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. He is majestic and his works are far above the comprehension of man. Now David said these are the things he's going to do. He's going to praise God. He's going to speak of the glorious honor of his majesty and of his wondrous works. I wonder, do we talk? Do we converse about God? Do we have conversations about God? We have conversations about everything else in the world, don't we? Politics and sports and weather, right? And food. And I love to talk about most of those things. But do we converse about the goodness and the greatness of God? Listen, that is why we worry. Because we don't talk about God. We talk about politics and weather and economy and sports and health and uh, and uh. well yeah 
But if we converse about the greatness of God, that's going to bring health to our situation. What do we do with this greatness? Verse 6, And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. Declaring the greatness of God. Did you know when you praise God, it defeats worry? One of the best ways we can defeat worry is by praising God. Thanking God for what He is, who He is, and what He's done. Praise is a great weapon against worry. And one of the ways to do this is to sing. Praising God. Verse 7. They shall abundantly utter the mercy of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. I hope you understand that the song service is not a means to an end. It's a very spiritual part of what goes on in this room. Very spiritual. And singing, especially praising God and lifting our voices to Him, not just going through the motions, is a great weapon against worry i'll tell you what you sing you sing about god you sing about the everlasting arms it's hard to feel like you're gonna fall right you sing about how love lifted me it's hard to think about how you're gonna be let down sing out and and david even tells us there he's gonna sing sing of his righteousness so the first thing to overcome worry we have to see god is great and we, pr- we praise him for his greatness. So that's the first certainty in life. God is great. He's so big and so smart and so powerful that we can't understand it. And there's nothing that will face us, no one that will come against us, nothing that comes into our lives that is outside of his sovereign control. He's too big. He's too big. The second thing in this passage, and that's verses 8 through 21, is that God is good. Look at verse 8. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. Aren't you thankful for those things mentioned in that verse? Gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. Brothers and sisters, I think we all this morning, in our hearts at least, ought to praise God for every one of those things in our lives personally this morning. Because without any of them, we are all on our way to a real hell. And this life is miserable without any of that. So he is good. These are the things we must remember. These are the things we must proclaim to ourselves and to others. When we praise God for these characteristics of himself, worry begins to fade. Look at verse 9. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. The Lord is good to all. Aren't you glad that when it says all, you are a part of all? The Lord is good to all. Listen, when we begin to worry about what we might have done to disqualify ourselves from God's goodness? Remember this. God is good to all. And you are part of all. And if God's good to all and you're a part of all, God's good to you. You say, well, Brother Phil, you don't know what I've done with my life. I don't. And I don't want to know. And you don't know what I've done with my life. And trust me, you don't want to know. But he does, and he's still good to all of us. To all of us. God is good to all. I love that. You know why? Who am I, right? Who are are we to deserve any of God's goodness? And somehow, you and I have been saved. We know God. We're in his family. Heaven is our home. He lives within us. He sealed us. He's possessing you right now. Literally, it's not a figurative thing. Literally, God is possessing you right now. And it's going to stay that way forever. 
He's good to all. He's good to all. His tender mercies, it says in verse 9, are over all his works. Did you know that you are the work of his hands? You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are the works of his hands, and his tender mercy is over you. Thanks be to God for his tender mercy. In verses 10 through 12, we're to make him known. Check it out. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. You see that kingdom, kingdom. He starts off at the beginning calling him king in verse 1. He is the king of kings. And his kingdom will reign forever. And we're to sing and we're to talk of it and we're to remember that you and I, by his grace, are a part of his everlasting kingdom. It's a kingdom without end. There's not going to be an enemy that's going to defeat the kingdom of God. And you and I are a part of that kingdom. Praise him for that. You say, I don't know what's going to happen to me. I do. I might get a bad test result. I might run out of money. Uh, A loved one may walk out on me. But I know the end. And the end is this. I have a God who has adopted me into his family. And he's not going to run out. And when I'm in his arms, I'm not going to need any other healing. And he's never going to run out of money to take care of me. And even if everything else goes away, I've got him for eternity. Say, well, that's kind of depressing to think that that's what it all boils. What are you talking about? That's that's encouraging. That's what it all boils down to. Make him known. He has an everlasting kingdom and you are a part of it. You're not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere. Verse 13. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. Your kingdom might come to an end. Figuratively, this kingdom is going to come to an end someday, unless he comes back first. This kingdom is going to meet its demise. But he that lives in me, his kingdom is never going to stop. And I'm a part of that by his grace. Verse 14, the Lord upholdeth all that fall and raiseth up all those that be bowed down. I just think of the everlasting arms, don't you? He upholds all that fall. And uh, you think about falling, you think about slipping, you think about going down. And, And when somebody catches you, how grateful you are that they caught you. That you didn't go all the way down. The ever lasting arms of God are not going to let you down. And you say, well, but what about, you know, what about my circumstances? That's a little season. It's just a little bit of time. Because the everlasting arms are still holding us even when this time goes away. We've got to change the way we think. And it's not easy. It's not easy. But we have to change the way we think about the outcome. We have to begin living in a mindset that this is a blip on the radar. This life. It is a small blip on the radar of the whole of what God has for us. Eternal life. And we can have joy And worry can go away if I begin living as a citizen of the everlasting kingdom. Verse 15. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. Yeah, everyone. You say, well, what about the people that don't believe in God? Well, how come every time there's a tragedy we're allowed to pray? God help us. Pray to God. Thoughts and prayers to everyone out. 
Why? Because when it all boils down to it, everybody's looking up. Yeah. We know that from Romans 1, don't we? When it all boils down, everybody's looking up. And I almost went down. I hope the everlasting arms would have kept me up right there, man. I just, just took a half a step too far there. But everybody's looking up. When, wor- when we worry, when we think God forgot what day it is. Don't we? We worry when we think God forgot where I am right now. We, we worry when we think that God doesn't know what our checkbook reads. We worry when we think that God doesn't know how we feel about the people who've walked out on us and, and how we're feeling now that we're alone. We worry when we think that God doesn't know what's wrong with us physically. We think that Google has all the answers, right? Google and the doctors, man, they'll tell you everything you need to know about what's wrong with you. We think that God somehow doesn't know, though. Remember, God knows what day it is. He knows what time it is. Verse 16. Thou open, I love this. Thou openest thine hand and satisfiest the desires of every living thing. Get that picture in your mind. You know what I think is really neat about this? I'm dumb when it comes to stuff like this. I, 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 I get uh, excited about the little silly things, but it says he opens his hand, not hands. You see that? He opens his hand, just one of them. In just one of God's hands is enough to satisfy every living thing. And just one. I, I wonder what's in the other one, don't you? What, if, if, if he's got all of that in just one hand, what in the world is in the other hand? But one of God's hands, he can open it, and it satisfies not just every person, every living thing. The ugliest sea creature. The grossest bug. The most fearsome beast. The smartest person in the world the incapable people in the world, in one of God's hands, he can satisfy every living thing. And he's not good. Verse 17. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. Don't forget this. He's always right and he's always holy. He's always right. And he's always holy. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. He's still in control. And he's still pure. No matter how we see it. Verse 18. The Lord is nigh, close, unto all that call upon him. To all that call upon him in truth. Now you notice how it says there he's close to all that call upon him in truth. You see how he went to the Degree of saying, not just all that call upon, upon, upon him, but all that call upon him in truth. What is that all about? Well, most of the time, worry is not based on fact. It's based on feeling. If you live by feeling, you can be convinced that God is unaware and uninvolved and unloving and unable. But if you live according to the truth, You know different. Call upon him in truth. Knowing that he's there. Knowing that he's a loving God and that he's in control. Verse 19. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. I wonder this morning, do you fear God? We throw that term around a lot that, you know, people aren't God-fearing anymore. Nobody fears God anymore. And there's, there's some, probably some truth to that. But really what it comes down to is, do I fear God? And we understand that fear in this context means a, a high respect, a high reverence for God. For God. 
Not religion. Not aversion. For God. Do you fear God? If He's just your spare tire, listen to this carefully now. If He, if God is just your spare tire, don't expect to feel a closeness to Him in your time of difficulty. Now understand that, right? Feelings. If I treat God like I treat my spare tire, how often do you get in your car and think, I'm thankful I got a spare back there? Never. Until you're boom, 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 right? Then you're like, oh yeah, thankful I got a spare back there. We never think of the spare tire. If I treat God like that, that he is out of my mind until something happens, I am not going to feel closeness. But because he's good, he is near. He's watching. Do you fear him? Because those who fear him will sense that closeness. Those that fear him don't have to wonder, uh, those that fear him and walk with him don't have to wonder when they pray if there's a God listening in the first place. You see, if I have a close walk with God and I'm walking with him every day and something happens, I'm not thinking, oh, what do I need to get out of the way first. God, forgive me for this. And God, you know, if it's been a long time and I don't ask for much, but God, I've, you know, God you, I just need you right now. God. It's like grabbing at straws, isn't it? It's just like throwing a hope out there. Oh, I hope, hope he's li-. But if you're walking with God, you're not, oh, I hope he's listening. You've got to walk with him, man. You've got a tightness, a closeness, a, a nighness, if you will, with him. And in your time of issue, of worry, when something comes into your life that could bring worry, if you're walking with God and you fear God, you're not wondering if He's around. Verse 20. The Lord preserveth all them that love Him, but all the wicked will He destroy. Now that sounds awesome and tough. If you love the Lord, you believe Him. You believe what he said about his son. And he preserves you. But all the wicked, all those who rejected his son and his sacrifice, will be destroyed. Pretty plain and simple. Verse 21 as we close. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. David said his mouth will speak the praise of the Lord. The question is, does my mouth, does your mouth, praise the Lord? What is our prayer time made up of? What is the majority of our prayers made up of? Requests, complaints, which, by the way, God tells us to bring our requests to Him. And we're allowed to pour our hearts out to Him and complain to Him. But do we praise Him? Do we spend any time on our prayers praising Him and thanking Him? Will I, will my mouth praise Him? See, these are the things to keep in mind when worry comes in. These are the things that will bring certainty and peace and calm. How can I defeat worry? Focus on two things that are certain, have always been certain, and will always be certain. God is great, and God is good. If you'd stand with me, please, and our musicians would come. So this morning, is, is, is worry something that comes and goes? I think for all of us it does at least. Or did you walk in maybe this morning with a load of care? Maybe you, you came this morning and you are just feeling the weight of something in your life that has arrested your mind with worry. And you can't get away from it. And you're just 
stuck on it. And it seems to consume you. It's all you think about. It's a pit in your stomach. And it's worry. Maybe this morning during our time of invitation, you just need to call out to God and be reminded of and thank Him for His greatness and His goodness. Think about Him. Praise Him for His greatness and His goodness. If you're in and out of seasons of worry, keep on the forefront of your mind God's greatness and His goodness. There's never a bad time to praise God. Maybe right now where you are, you want to come forward, just bow your head and praise Him for His greatness and for His goodness. If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, and you're not even one of God's children, maybe today you would make the decision to call out to Jesus and ask Him to save you. If you would do that, I'll be standing right here when they sing. You can come down. I'll show you out of the Word of God how you can know Christ as your Savior and have heaven as your home. As they sing this morning, let us be obedient to God's Spirit and talk to Him as He's asked as they sing.